this evening, as well as great to have others here with us. Uh, it was a couple months ago, I really wanted to have the Sheetles in and uh, have Pastor Sheetle share with us what the Lord is doing in their hearts and lives and in their church. Uh, back in 2020, there were, there were a num number of uh, pestilences going on. Uh, one was called a pandemic, the other was called an election. I don't think either of them turned out too well, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but in the midst of that, God planted a church. And I really appreciate the heart and soul that he has for the ministry there. Uh, he has a tremendous passion. Of course, Brother Adam had come here and uh, spent an internship one summer and, and really showed a desire and a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, through that, he had the opportunity to meet Rebecca, Rebecca the love of his life. And uh, now as they have a family together, and it's great to see their family multiplying as well. So he's doing his part to build the church uh, as they continue to have children as well. And we thank the Lord for that. But uh, there's exciting things. As he sends out prayer letters, I always read them. There's always something happening, opportunities happening. And I really appreciate what they are doing. They are just north of the Hamburg area, better known for Cabela's, if you're familiar with that. I remember him taking me up there during the internship and showing me all the needy uh, areas up there and uh, some of the ones that he was burdened for. And so the Lord has established Greater Hope, ba or, uh, Amazing Grace Baptist Church, excuse me, Amazing Grace Baptist Church there in the Orwigsburg area. So they're going to sing. I used to get nervous whenever I saw someone come to the platform with a guitar. I probably still would but I know him, so I know we're okay. Uh, they're going to come and sing special music for us, and then he's going to share what the Lord has laid upon his heart. Thank you, Pastor Schweitzer. Uh, my family is going to come in just a moment, and uh, we'll sing together. Uh, but it certainly is a privilege to be back here. Uh, every time I come back here, there's always a few extra faces that I don't recognize. So I think that's a good thing. I hope it's not because I'm just forgetting everybody's name. But if I do forget your names, I apologize for that. But the Lord is good. It's hard to believe that we've been church planting now for three and a half years. And I can't wait to share some of the things that, uh, that God has been doing and some of our visions uh, to continue ministering to the Lord uh, later this year. So this time, Rebecca and Daniel are gonna, going to come, and we're going to sing a song. In him we hide, I shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, I shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, the weary land, the weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes upright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Divine, oh refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, 
Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. In just a moment, we're going to share some pictures. I don't have a regular missionary presentation to share with everyone, uh, but I do have some pictures that I'd like to share, some things that have happened in, uh, well, basically in the last couple months and also this morning at our service today. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we've been church planting for three and a half years. Uh, a COVID pandemic is a very unique time to plant a church, but uh, it was of the Lord. Uh, we have a, it's still a small church, but uh, typically we'll have about 20 people that show up on a Sunday service. We have 17 members. All but one of those members have been brought in through uh, salvation and, and baptism. And uh, I, I praise the Lord for that. Uh, church planting is a lot of hard work. There's just no other way to describe it, uh, but it is always worth it when you see someone make that decision of faith. Uh, this past year, uh, 2023, we were able to baptize uh, four different individuals and add them to the church. Uh, we knocked on a ton of doors as a church, and um, I'm trying to think what else we did. Uh, we had a conference at the end of the year, and that was always exciting. We, uh, we had a couple of Singspiration outreaches, and I'll share a little bit about those. What we do is we'll reserve a pavilion that is as close to the center of town as I can find. And uh, the Saturday before, we'll knock on all the doors that are nearby, and we'll invite folks to a Sunday night Singspiration. And I'll get my guitar out, we'll sing uh, a whole bunch of gospel songs, uh, right out in the open air, and like I said, it's as close to the center of town as I can, as we can be. And so there's all kinds of people walking by who can hear it. Uh, normally, we get about 10 first-time visitors for these singspirations, and we held a couple of them. And uh, at the end, uh, I'll have someone share their salvation testimony and how you, uh, anyone, can receive Jesus as their Savior. And uh, we had a very interesting experience with one of these uh, singspirations last summer. Uh, the, the, one of the neighbors didn't like what was going on. And so he turned on the radio real loud. And there's an, old, uh, an older gentleman, and uh, he's, he's a great gentleman, but he was sharing his salvation testimony, and about five minutes into it, the radio goes up, and I just walk up to him and say, you got to holler at the top of your lungs. And I put him right in the center of the pavilion, and he says, well, I can, I, I can lift up my voice. And he just starts hollering. After a few minutes, the guy turned the radio back down. But uh, it was interesting. There was a lot of visitors there for that one. And there were several people sitting on their porches listening in. And, uh, and they, they said later they really appreciated the old-fashioned singing. Uh, you know, truthfully, there's a lot of people, even out there in the world, who appreciate traditional music. And I, I use it because I have lots of people when I'm knocking on doors, they ask me, what kind of singing do you have? And I say, it's, it's, it's very traditional because that's the way they understand it. And there's actually a lot of people that really do appreciate that. And, uh, and it's because the truth cannot be denied. Godly conservative music is, is, is true God-honoring music, and you can't deny that. And uh, even, even, the, even the people of the world, they do see that. And, uh, and you can take an instrument like the guitar, and you can play it appropriately and play it properly in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord. But anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the Singspirations, you know, we had, we had a couple of great outreaches with that, and uh, I really appreciate all the labors that everyone did. Um, it's winter time, so we haven't had much happening in the winter months. I mean, we can't hold a, a, an outdoor singspiration. We can't really be out knocking on doors. But there's a couple of things that we've been doing the past couple of months. And uh, if, if, you, if the gentlemen are ready, uh, maybe you can throw some of the pictures up here on the screen. I'm just going to stand off to the side here and talk about some of these. Uh, so in our home, the back of our home is like this. Our bedroom is on this side, Daniel's bedroom is on this side, my office is in the middle, and this is a walk-through room. So with two boys, uh, it, became, it became too much. So I said, Rebecca, we got to do something. This is our backyard, and uh, we decided to uh, build an office in January. My brother-in-law, Aaron, he spearheaded the effort, but um, you can switch to the next picture. My dad got involved, my brother's involved. That's... Uh, you, sh you should recognize the one gentleman on the far right, that's Pastor Terry. Uh, that was, this was his first week of retirement. We tried to work him to death and convince him to go back into ministry for you. 
but uh, we failed. He said he liked it. And so anyway, he's, he's still serving the Lord. But uh, you, uh, you can see Aaron's up there, and uh, it was just a lot of help. You can go to the next, next picture. Um, this is what it basically looks like when it was over. And uh, if you go to the inside picture, uh, that's Pastor Terry's desk. And I really appreciate Pastor Schweitzer and the church here donating that to us. Uh, that's what the inside is like now that it is, um, uh, now that it is, all, it is all finished. I'm trying to look sideways. I think my camera must have been cocked sideways or something, or maybe that's just me. Anyway, uh, that's what we did. It took us, uh, it took about four guys a, a, about a week's worth of work to get to build that, and then I've been touching up certain things ever since then. But this past week, I've been able to sit in and sit and just be in the quiet of my own, my own space. And it's been great for my devotions and great for my study time. And so I'm, I'm very uh, thankful for the help between uh, my father, my father-in-law, my brother, my brother-in-law, and a couple other individuals who pitched in. And uh, this, is, this, is a, this, is a, this is a huge uh, benefit for me. I needed to find a quiet space. And so I'm excited for the Lord to use this space uh, in, in both to help my preaching and also to be a blessing to the people that I have the opportunity to minister with. The other thing I'd like to share, and this is actually something that happened this morning. Uh, this morning, well, the Lord has given me a burden to try to encourage some more of our people. I mean, many of our people are new believers and uh, just getting their feet wet in a lot of things of the Christian life. But um, I've been trying to think of ways to encourage them to be a little more bold and, and a little more involved in their outreach. And so I decided that uh, it was about time we did another John and Romans project. And so this morning, we took 8,000 John and Romans, and we put them in the packets to be delivered. And so, uh, yes, uh, this, is, this is what we got here. Uh, not all the people that you see in these pictures are members. Here, keep this picture. Uh, go back to the next picture. Uh, keep this one up for a moment. Not everyone in these pictures are members. Some of them were folks from our sending church who came up to help us for today. But I do want to draw attention to this picture. Uh, each of the ladies in this picture were baptized in 2023. And if you notice, the lady on the far left, she started coming to our church about a year ago, right about this time. And the reason she started coming was because in 2020, someone put a John and Romans booklet on her door with our information. It took until February of 2023 for her to finally realize she needed God in her life. She pulled out that John and Romans booklet, found our church information, started coming to church. She got saved. And uh, she, she told me today, this is so much fun. This is, I, I, I love this. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, one of the other ladies, the lady in the middle here, she came up to me when it was all over and she said, I can't wait to help start passing these out. Uh, when are we going to start doing this? And uh, I told her, well, we're going we're gonna to do it the last uh, Saturday of every month. Uh, we're going to go out as a church and we're going to pass out John and Roma's booklets. So you can move on to the next picture here. Uh, this is not all the boxes that were finished. Uh, they, they all have the packets in them. There's actually several more boxes that uh, were often stacked elsewhere. Um, but that's what we were able to finish. I praise the Lord for all the help that we had. Uh, there's a part of me that's currently exhausted because I had to be the slave driver and uh, keeping everybody working just as fast as they possibly could. And I praise the Lord that um, it all helped. Are there any more pictures or is that the last one? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, this is just another picture. Uh, if you see uh, the gentleman uh, sitting at the table in the blue shirt, uh, I just want to draw attention to him. That is Bill. That is the first gentleman I ever baptized. And so he's been a faithful member of the church. And his, uh, uh, his daughter got saved, and I baptized her last week. And his wife needs to be saved. And she came out to, uh, today to participate. So it was good to, uh, good to make another connection uh, with her. But uh, if uh, I'll just say this. If all of the family members of our current members uh, were, were saved and part of the church, we'd probably have at least another 10 members. Uh, so there's certainly, uh, you know, people that need to be reached right within the families of our own church. Uh, but anyway, this is what we're doing. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate that. I appreciate the, uh, the sound guys. It was a little hectic because I had to send them pictures about 10 minutes before the service, and they just needed to get it together. But uh, thank you all for that. Uh, but that's uh, one of the big things that we're looking ahead to do this summer. Uh, passing out the 8,000 John and Romans booklets to uh, various communities. Of course, we're going to be knocking on doors again. Uh, we're going to do a couple more uh, singspirations at a couple different parks. Uh, I want, another thing I want to do this summer is try to hold a vacation Bible school. We held one a couple years ago, but that was primarily because folks from our sending church came up and did it for us. 
I was able to stand in the background and say, good job, everyone. Uh, but um, there's, there's a few different young people in our church, and I, I, think, I think I have enough help to, to be able to do it. And so we'd like to take a step of faith and hold a vacation Bible school uh, this summer. That'll be held in July. Uh, our, our building where we meet is in a banquet hall, and the banquet hall is located at a flower shop slash Christmas tree farm. So we decided we're going to hold a Christmas in July themed vacation Bible school. That way we won't need to spend any money at all on decorations. We already have them all. And, uh, but anyway, we'll be doing a lot of promotions for that. We'll pray that the Lord brings in several children and several young people. Uh, but that's what we're planning to do. Another thing we're going to do this summer is um, in August, we're ho- uh, Brother Chuck Harding, I believe you've had him here a few times, he's going to be coming in and he's going to be preaching a Revive America conference. We've held, we held a Revive America conference a couple of years ago. We had a lot of visitors come out for that, and uh, we want to hold another one. I like, uh, we call, it's basically an evangelistic conference, but we call it a Revive America conference. And Ed, I, I like to put it this way, we, we preach the gospel with a patriotic twist because our nation's in a mess, and no amount of politics is going to get us out of this mess, not until people start getting their hearts right with God. And so we can draw people and point people to uh, the, real, the real answer, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, he'll be coming in August, so we'll have that. And I hope you'll be praying for all these things. Pray for the John and Romans. Pray for our Singspirations. Pray for the Vacation Bible School, the conference in August. Uh, one other thing I want to share is um, we decided as a church to open up an internship program. And I've been reaching out to some places, and I'm praying that the Lord provides an intern to come and, and help us. I believe our church is a very unique uh, aspect in the sense that we're still in the church planting phase. Um, you know, I came here, I was an intern here, I was an intern at a couple of other different churches, but having the opportunity to work at a church that's got 17 members, and every single person counts, and every single visitor counts. Uh, because you need those connections to build a church. It's a very unique uh, aspect, and I could certainly uh, use, use the help. And uh, that's, uh, there's actually a young man that I've been in touch with, and we we'll are talking with him again in a couple of days, and I pray that the Lord leads him to come and be a blessing uh, to us. Uh, so you can all be praying about all, all of those things. Does anyone have any questions at all, anything at all you're curious about? quiet crowd tonight. Did I put everybody to sleep already? I hope not. I doubt that. All right. You can feel free to talk to me uh, or my wife afterwards. Um, My son, Daniel, is probably a bundle of energy because it's already been a long day. My other son, Matthew, he's four months old. We praise the Lord for him. Uh, He's a a wonderful little baby, and we're thrilled to have a, a, a growing family and a growing church. You're right, Pastor. We need to grow a church any way we can. So, um, uh, we praise the Lord for, uh, for both of our sons, and uh, I selfishly am praying that both of them turn out to be church planters one day, but uh, we'll see how the Lord leads. Oh, real quick, I forgot I had this. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, these are the packets that we put together, just in simple sleeves. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but John Roman's book on that side, church invitation on this side, and if you would like to, you know, just take a look at this, I have, I have a couple of these that I just brought along just to show anybody in case you would like. All right, uh, let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. This passage is the parable of the sower, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. I'm just going to read this passage and um, explain very briefly what it means. Then I want to provide four applications of this passage. The Bible says, Mark chapter 4, verse 1, And he began to teach by the seaside, And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. 
And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Let us skip down to verse number 13. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word of God. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they had heard the word, immediately they received it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it become unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of reaping a harvest in a barren land. America is a barren land. America is turning her back on God. You could, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say America has already turned her back on God. America is an immoral, sin-loving, God-hating, post-Christian nation. We are certainly a barren land. The wayside in America is great. The thorns are tall. Rocks are plentiful. And it seems as though the good ground is very scarce. And we as believers, we want to reap a harvest. But these obstacles appear to be standing in our way. How is it possible to reap a harvest in such a barren land as the United States of America. Two quick observations. First, know that it can be done. God commanded us to go regardless of the condition of the land. And so it certainly can be done. God does not send us to do things that cannot be done. It can be done. Second, there are things that can be done to improve or increase the harvest. I want to take a few minutes to, well, I've already, uh, to ex- just ex- explain a little bit more about this parable, and then I want to pull some applications from this parable and from other principles in Scripture about sowing and reaping that demonstrate that the harvest can be improved and you can indeed reap a harvest in a barren land. So let's, let's explain a couple things just so that we all understand this. The sower is the believer. That's you and I. We are all sowers, and the seed is the gospel, the word of God. And there's a world full of people out there who need the seed of God's word planted in their hearts so that they can be saved. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The seed's planted in the wayside. Now, the wayside is, is like the 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 trodden down path that's been walked on so much that it's hard and compacted and there's just no opportunity for seeds to take root. Uh, The seeds in the wayside are devoured by birds. This represents Satan's work preventing people from being saved. Satan is indeed at work. He walketh about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. He is trying to prevent the word and the gospel from taking effect in people's lives. The seeds that are planted in the stony ground are scorched by the sun. This represents those who, maybe they make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, but they turn away when the Christian life gets difficult. There's a gentleman I know, I'll just share this real quick. Uh, He's an evangelist today, an elderly man, and uh, when he was young, he was in a band. 
and uh, he, he got saved, and he went to church, and the very first Sunday at church, the pastor preached on John 3.16, and he said, he went home and said, I am so glad I'm a believer today. The next Sunday he went to church, the pastor preached on rock music, and he went away and said, oh boy, this is hard, you mean I got to give this up? And it took several weeks, but he finally gave up his music and was dedicated to the Lord. Um, this represents those who, who make a profession of faith, and then they get challenged, or they realize, you know what, the Christian life is not all that, it's, that I thought it was. It's not easy. It's not the easy street. And then they, they turn away. They're unfruitful. The seeds in the thorny ground are choked out, choked out by weeds. This represents those who maybe they make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, or they appear to be a believer, but they love the world more than they love God. Think about this. The average American is consumed with his house and his job and his car and his savings account and his retirement and their vacations, and that's the decent Americans. If the decent Americans are wrapped up with the love of money, that ought to tell us just how bad our nation really is. Thankfully, there is such a thing as good ground. The good ground thrives and bears fruit, and this represents those who believe in Jesus for salvation and they're not choked out by the weeds. They're not scorched by the sun. They bear fruit as a Christian ought to. Fact. Very few people are getting saved these days. And there's a pastor I know. He started a church about 45 years ago, well, probably about 50 years ago now. And I had the opportunity to be at his 40th, the 40th anniversary of their service. And there was a lot of people there. And at that 40th anniversary service, they went around the room and they said, how many people got saved at this ministry? Hands went up all over the place. And people raised their hand and said, I got saved 40 years ago when pastor knocked on my door and witnessed to me. Someone raised their hand and said, I got saved 35 years ago when they, 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 came, they came to my neighborhood and they picked me up and they brought me to vacation Bible school and person after person after person. That, that pastor had led dozens, maybe hundreds of people to the Lord in the early phases of his ministry. I've been at this for three and a half years and... I mean, we certainly have not seen dozens. Maybe we've seen uh, a dozen or, or 20 people trust Christ. And of those, some have been baptized and some have been added to our church. It's not the same. People are not getting saved as plentifully these days. Why? The problem? The land is barren. The solution is laborers. Laborers are needed. And based upon this parable and some Bible teachings on sowing and reaping, I want to give you four applications, four things that can be done to improve the harvest. Number one, the efforts of the laborer. The efforts of the laborer. This is very important. Jesus said in Matthew 9, the harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. Now, we've all worked, you've all worked jobs. If you have children, you've seen your children work in your home. Not all labor is equal. Today, we were assembling John and Roman's booklets, and there was like a seven-year-old boy sitting at this one table and, you know, trying to fit these things into the bag, and he was working very slowly, and his mom was standing beside of him, and she's fitting them in, you know, going to town on it. Not all labor is equal. Some people are really hard, fast workers. Some people are lazy. And one of the problems that we have here in the United States of America is it's so hard that we take a backseat approach. That's dangerous because the work needed is greater today than the work that was needed 10 years ago. There's more work to be done. The efforts of the labor is paramount. Uh, how, how about this? Ten people can get a lot more work done than one. How many people show up for visitation? You know, 20 people get a lot more done than 10. The efforts of the laborer is very important. How much effort is going in? I want to read this verse from the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, this is written under inspiration of Scripture. So Paul is not boasting in pride. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. That I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not, was not in vain. Now, I'm going to read the rest of that in just a moment. 
But Paul is basically saying, I am an apostle. I'm the least of the apostles because I was a persecutor. And it's, it's only by God's grace that I am what I am. And then Paul says this, I labored more abundantly than they all. You know, if you read the book of Acts, Paul labored more than Peter. Paul labored more than the other apostles, and the word of God bears that out, that Paul labored more abundantly. There are probably thousands of people in heaven because of the efforts of the apostle Paul. There uh, were probably over 150 churches established because of the efforts of the apostle Paul. Do you see how important the effort is? What's your effort input on a scale of 1 to 10? Now, Paul, if I had to make a guess about Paul, I'd say he was in the 90s. If I had to make a guess about me, I'd say I'm doing pretty low. If I had to make a guess about the average American Christian, I'd say very low. No wonder it's a barren land. More laborers are needed to accomplish the work. The harvest is plenteous. It's the laborers that are few. What can you do to increase or improve the harvest? Well, get involved in the laboring process. Number two, the quantity of the seeds. Now, sometimes I'm not that smart, but I do know this. If I put in one seed, I have a chance at getting one plant. And that one could get scorched by the sun or choked out by the thorns. If I put in 10 seeds, I have the opportunity to get 10 plants. And if you, and you go out to a farmer's field, you've got lots of farmers around here. How many seeds do they put in the field? Hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands probably. They are putting in a lot of seeds, a lot of effort, a lot of seeds. Um, I want to read a couple of verses from Galatians. If you want to turn there with me, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 bears out a couple extra principles regarding sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8, For he that soweth to the flesh of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, this passage is not necessarily referring to gospel seeds. It's referring to uh, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap some uh, fleshly consequences. But if you sow spiritual things, you will reap God's reward. Uh, that's a little closer to what this, these verses are referring to. But uh, I want to I pull real quickly two facts based on these verses. You always reap what you sow. If you sow ungodliness, you're going to get some ungodliness back. If you start sowing godliness in your life, you're going to reap some godly rewards in return. You always reap what you sow. If you start sowing some gospel seeds, you will reap some gospel rewards in the sense of people getting saved. Another thing, you always reap more than what you sow. A farmer goes out, he's planting corn. One seed goes in the ground. A corn stalk comes up. How many ears of corn does he get off one corn stalk? At least one, maybe two, maybe three. How many kernels of corn are on one ear of corn? A lot. Does anybody want to count them? I hope not. But some people, someone's going to be looking at their corn later this summer saying, I wonder how many are on here. And then, you, then the next thought is going to be, I'm not going to bother counting. I'm just going to eat. Uh, but uh, you always reap what you sow. You always reap more than what you sow. Well, why are we not seeing a harvest? Because someone is not sowing. Probably many of us are not sowing as we ought. Let me ask you these questions. How many doors do you need to knock on before someone is willing to speak to you? How many tracts must you hand out before one is read? And I realize most gospel tracts find their way in the trash. Most of these John and Romans booklets will find their way in the trash. But how many need to be passed out before someone actually reads it? How many people must you invite to church before the person actually visits how many conversations must you have with a person before they believe? Now, the answer to all of these questions is a lot. You need to invite a lot of people to get them out to church. You need to pass out a lot of gospel tracts before one is read. You need to, uh, talk to talk to someone and pray over a soul a lot before they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
But that ought not to discourage us from putting in less effort. If anything, it ought to motivate us to say, well, if I've got to pass out more gospel tracts, then, then let me grab a couple more at church this week. The quantity of the seeds is important. The more seeds that are sown, the greater the harvest that can be reaped. Third principle, the quality of the soil. Quality of the soil. Now let's just imagine that the year is like, 1725 and you're living in London England and you get tired of life over in England and you decide to come to the American colonies and of all the colonies you decide to come to the one called Pennsylvania now do you think when you arrive you'll find nice plush perfect meadows ready for plowing and planting and harvesting mm -mm. that's the way it is today how did it get the way to the way it is today? Well, farmers went out in the ground and they cut down the trees and then they pulled out the roots and then they took the rocks that were in the, in the ground and they tossed the rocks to the side and they pulled out the thorn bushes and they cultivated it and they fertilized it and they made it into a fertile ground. You know, it's possible. Let me back up. Uh, it, I don't know how many rock piles you see around here, but uh, in the farms up in, in our area, the, the Schuylkill County has a lot of rocks. Uh, we're a coal county traditionally. I've been told that the soil in Schuylkill County is 30% less productive than in Berks County and in Lancaster County, simply because of the number of rocks that we have. Uh, there are many farmers' fields that I drive by, and the side of the field is lined with rocks. Some farmer was plowing it up, pulled up rocks, and then he went out and he took those rocks and he cast them to the side. You say, oh, America is such a stony ground. Hearts are so hard. Well, start pulling out some rocks. Say, there's so many thorns and there's so many weeds. What do you parents do when you have a garden and it's full of weeds? You send the kids out to start pulling them. You got to start going out and start pulling out some weeds. What do you do when the wayside is trodden down? You can go out with a shovel and with a hoe and you can loosen that dirt up again. The quality of the soil is important. You can talk to any farmer and they'll tell you that when they find a rock in their field, they pull it out. And they'll tell you that when they get thorns and weeds in their field, they pull them out. There's four different kinds of soil. Don't just throw in the towel because there's not a lot of good ground. Get involved and do what is necessary to improve the soil. The efforts of the laborer, the quantity of the seeds, the quality of the soil, and number four is the blessing of God. You can count the number of seeds that go in the ground. You can count the number of, you know, John and Roma's booklets you pass out. You can count the number of people who you talk to, but there's no mathematical formula to measure God's blessing upon your life as you go to someone. Say, here, will you read this? You can't measure that. And there's no way you can measure the conviction that the Holy Spirit is implementing in the other person's life as you're trying to talk to them. But God is not going to witness to people himself. God has done his part in sacrificing Jesus Christ on the cross so that mankind can be saved. And the Holy Spirit is doing his part, convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, but you need to do your part in the sense that you're the one that God has designated to take the truth to the unbelievers. God's not going to do it. The angels are not going to do it. The Holy Spirit's not going to do that. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God says, you need to go. And you need to talk to someone. And when you do talk to someone, a seed is planted in their heart, and that's when God kicks in, and he begins working in their heart and in their life and drawing them and showing them their need to, for salvation. You know, uh, folks, I fear that we are not giving God much to work with these days. Let's change that. The Apostle Paul said in... 1 uh, Corinthians 3, I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. We need to get busy planting some seeds. 
We need to get busy watering some seeds. We need to get busy praying over some seeds so that God's blessing can work. Put yourself out there. Uh, God cannot bless his word if it's not preached. God cannot uh, bless the gospel if it's not shared. God cannot answer prayers that are not prayed. Put yourself out there. Pass out some gospel tracts. Invite people to come to church. Go witnessing. Share your testimony with someone. You might say, I, I, I don't know how to tell someone how to get saved. Well, you know how you got saved. Go out and find someone and tell them how you got saved and then tell them, if you do what I did and you mean it, God will save you too. There's your, there's your invitation. Uh, and, and, and then after you do it, pray that God will work. I can't save anybody, you can't save anybody, but you can do your part, and then God will kick in. God will sit in, and he will do what he needs to do. If no one is getting saved, the problem is not the soil. Okay, you can't, you can't look around and say, America is a barren land. There's just no hope. It might be barren, but that's not the real problem. We, we, can, we can work with that. We can make that better. Uh, the problem is not the seed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this book. There's everything right with this book. It's not that the seeds don't work anymore. The seeds work just as well today as they did back in Paul's day. The problem is not the harvest. In fact, there's a lot more harvest. Uh, let me put it this way. There's more harvest in Denver, Pennsylvania today than there was 20 or 30 years ago when you started Mount Zion Baptist Church. The harvest has gotten even greater. The problem is not the Lord of the harvest. God is not at fault for the condition of America. The problem is the labor is involved. It all comes back to us. We hold the solution right here within ourselves. And if America is barren, it's not because of all of that. It's because we are not putting in the work that is necessary to get the job done. You all got a building project that you're starting. Uh, Everything looked very different when I got here. I'm glad my mother-in-law uh, gave us a little bit of a warning before we arrived. How would you feel if the laborers involved were lazy? It would take forever to get done. You wouldn't stand for it, right? How do you think God feels when the labor, when the work just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? God is looking for people who will rise to the task. What kind of laborer are you? I challenge you, be a hard worker, a hard laborer in God's service. Put in your best effort. Sow a lot of seeds. Improve the quality in the soil around you. And give God something to work with. I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it back over to Pastor Schweitzer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the parable of the sower, and for the truth it represents. Thank you for putting us in this land, in this day and age today. And even though it is a barren land that we are surrounded in, Father, I pray that you would give us the heart, the courage, the determination that we need to go out and put in the work necessary to reap a harvest in this barren land. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.